It's been said that ogres are like onions. <laughs> There's many layers, and this speaks to the complexity of what it is to be an ogre. It could also be said that atmospheres are like onions, using the same line of thought. It's separated by temperature and density of gases. It's kind of interesting. But you could really never say that ogres are like atmospheres, because that's too much of a leap. Right? In trying to get your idea across to, the, to your audience, you'd end up losing them, and they would probably just, what are you talking about? Why? Because ogres are not a good model for atmospheres, and vice versa. It's particularly important to have explanations very, very concise when you're a science teacher and you're speaking to your students. So I'm here today to discuss the dangers of a particular, a particular experiment, a particularly bad model for teaching chemistry and geology. But before that, in 2001, I became a science teacher. This is actually when I started my, my internship. As a, I, I started teaching at this wonderful school, Stone Middle, which is right down the street. Uh, I was working with uh, this man right here, who was my supervising teacher, Richard Regan, uh, a juggernaut of thinking and probably the best secondary science teacher I've ever seen in my entire life. And I had the luxury of being trained by him. Also, his very gifted science teacher wife, who uh, even to this day has a, bio, a BS2 level laboratory in her room. These are with 7th and 8th graders. Also on that team is Mr. Gordon Shoup, who is another juggernaut of teaching science and technology. And as a matter of fact, I am very, very, very fortunate to have these three people in here. But you know what? Gordon's here today. So, Gordon, raise your hand. So they taught me to be a fearless, a fearless science teacher, where there's not much that you can't do with your students. Matter of fact, you just have to think of a couple things. First of all, is there a budget for it, and will it hurt them? You know, these are mostly what we thought of. And we did amazing things with our students. And to this day, they're still going on. We would take about 60 or so, maybe a little bit more, give or take, students, these, these little you know, bundles of snot and joy that come through the door and then turn them into scientists to do amazing things. We built, we built underwater ROVs. We built uh, amazing uh, kites. Well, that one broke, but uh, capable of, <laughs> of data collection. We built, we built uh, tracks for maglev cars, built trebuchet, and threw fruit in the yard and almost hit the uh, custodian. And, uh, and, and anything we could, a robot, if we could find a robot, we will program it and make it do anything we want. Uh, it was, they changed me. They changed me as a person. And now, unfortunately, that, that year that I graduated, I wasn't able to take a job at Stone Middle School. Um, I, but they did snap me up at a play, local place called O'Galley High School. So O'Galley High School is actually interesting. That's where I went to high school, so it was particularly weird. And I, and I actually taught in the very room that I was inspired initially to teach. So it was kind of like this woo 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 kind of moment here. <laughs> so they put me in a room that needed a tall guy with a good attitude. And so I taught, so, <laughs> so underachievers. <laughs> so what I was in front of, uh, underachievers. But to help scratch the itch that was developed at, si at Stone Middle School, they gave me a, a class of science research. So when I went in there the first day, when I, when I had the first day, I had five students in my science research class. Now, I was used to and had been trained with over 60 students in this particular, in this particular job. So having five seemed a little like, what? Come on, really? I'm used to going out of my mind. I can't go out of my mind with five people. So I started recruiting from my other pool of underachievers because that seemed to be the right place to start because they were, off, after all, they were in my room. So I started recruiting them. You know, and because I feel really, really, really strongly about providing good research, act, uh, good research assignments for my students, and I think this is something that we, we should all, to, all aspire to. Uh, I felt very, very strongly about this because the goal of any teacher, any teacher worth their weight, 
no matter the subject, is scientific literacy. Okay? Scientific literacy, now just to be clear, scientific literacy is not the same thing as science literacy, which is the knowledge and understanding of science concepts. Okay, no, scientific literacy is a little bit different. It's the knowledge and understanding of scientific concepts and processes required for personal decision making, participation in civic and cultural affairs, and, and economic productivity. This is what we want from our students. This is what we want from all of the people. We really ultimately require two things, happy and productive. That's what we want. This is what we want for our children. The way to it is through scientific literacy. So the very first day, I get all my new recruits in. We're ready to go. Yeah, you're going to do a science fair project, and we're going to go and compete, and it's going to be great, and everybody's wondering. And so my, my new students are like, so we get, we get to make a vinegar and baking soda volcano? You know, this has been around for a long time. Have you heard of this concept? Yeah, baking soda and vinegar, you throw it in a volcano, and all of a sudden you're a wizard. Huh. But I, I'm speaking to this particular model today, this particular model, because I find, from my vantage point, a model such as a vinegar and baking soda volcano offers more confusion than it does solution. It will impede the de development of scientific literacy, and this is something that we must rebel against, right? After all, it's kind of like saying an ogre is like an atmosphere. There's too many steps in between. So ladies and gentlemen, this next particular, this demonstration that I'm going to show you today has been known by many names. I believe one of them was the floating bubbles, but that's lame. That's a lame title. So I'm planting my stake into the ground. The flag is flying, and this will be forever known as the amazing Gasparral's demonstration. Is I, there but one question that I have? Are you ready? Hmm. I asked a simple question. I didn't get a very good answer. I asked you, are you ready? Yeah, yeah let's get off. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. This chemical equation is taking our world by storm. And you're going to look at me and go, whoa, 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 you didn't tell me, it didn't say on the sign out there that those letters and numbers were going to be there. This is chemistry, my friends. And what I'm showing you right now, nothing to be afraid of. These are just representations of atoms and ions. This is what, when you say vinegar and baking soda reaction, this is what a scientist sees, OK? So just bear with me if it blows your mind to see that. It's OK. Take a deep breath. We're all scientists, after all. So this, of course, is the reaction between baking soda, also known as sodium bicarbonate, and vinegar, also known as acetic acid. OK. All right. Gone are the days of the cognitive dissonance provided by this particular vinegar and baking soda volcano. This is a picture from a science fair in 1932, by the way. Our students are suffering from the impact that has had on scientific literacy in this particular country, and I am tired of it. And I'm going to tell you why, because it's a bad model. It's a bad model, and I'm going to show you for three reasons. The number one reason is that this chemical, really, this chemical equation really has nothing to do with volcanoes. Ugh. First of all, volcanoes are a physical process. This is when magma in the mantle rises up to the surface, gas is compressed, and all of a sudden, kaboom! It's a big physical event, a physical event that happens. Volcanoes, volcanic eruptions, are not the result of mixing two chemicals. No, they are not. It is a physical, a physical activity that happens. Incidentally, you take a little bit of vinegar and baking soda, you put it in a cup, you shake it around a little bit, it'll actually get a little cooler because it's an endothermic reaction. Endothermic reactions, of course, are reactions that are accompanied by or requiring the absorption of heat. So it will feel a little cooler when you do this. It's true. You can also do the same thing with Alka-Seltzer, which is actually a very similar process, process too. It will get a little cooler. Not much. You're not going to make an air conditioner out of it, but just enough. It's interesting. It's worth noting. The second reason is that volcanoes are not created from paper mache, clay, or anything that deals with glue at all. As a matter of fact, 
Volcanoes, if you don't know, are actually made out of mountains. And mountains, to date, are made out of rock. Now, the, th the third reason that this particular equation, uh, uh, that baking soda and vinegar volcanoes don't work, for me, is that lava can often come from volcanoes. Not always, but molten rock, right? And in this equation, r right here, the products are sodium acetate, carbon dioxide, and water. And there is nothing to do with lava in there. So ladies and gentlemen, you can see for yourself that the problems certainly outweigh the positive in this reaction. The volcano, which is a physical reaction, is not the same as the reaction between baking soda and vinegar, which is a chemical reaction. And this is how we obscure the path to scientific literacy. It's an awful thing. Okay? It makes learning very, very difficult when that stretch is so extreme. So when performing this reaction as it relates to volcanoes, when asking my students about what did they actually get out of this, because I performed it, what did you get out of this, I said to my students. And the first student said, well, uh, I don't know. Not too uncommon. Another one said, do it again. Super excited. And my favorite response from the audience was, it smells like my Easter eggs did. So as you can see, the cognitive dissonance that exists goes across many different, many different ideas here. It's very much, very much like saying ogres are like atmospheres. And so this demonstration of vinegar and baking soda volcanoes has existed for many, many years, as I said before, in many days of yore. But that day, my friends, is not today. For today is a new day, and I shall respond once again with that question. Are you ready for the amazing Gosmeral's demonstration? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. So this requires an aquarium. It doesn't require a horn. I brought that for fun. Sometimes you got to do it for yourself. It also requires baking soda. Please try this at home. <laughs> and of course, our favorite friend, vinegar. Now, vinegar is also known as acetic acid. It's acetic acid, it's 5% um, by weight. So you can see right here, there's something going on there, right? There's something going on in this particular aquarium. There's bubbles, it's indicative of a science uh, of, a, of a reaction. So let's talk about this for a minute. Right now what you're watching is a double displacement reaction where atoms that are made up of A and B are combined with an atoms of B and C and they form what you would expect in something that's displacing two times. So A is going with C and B is going with D. All right, so this looks super scary. I know you're looking at the, whoa, 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 what's going on here, you know? This is just sodium bicarbonate right here is mixing with acetic acid and it's forming sodium acetate and carbonic acid. And you're gonna say for a second, whoa, 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 whoa! What is that? What does aqueous mean? I mean, sorry, what does AQ mean in parentheses? Ah, well, AQ stands for aqueous, which just means dissolved in water. We're learning science, people, this is for real. But don't freak out, it's okay. Now, I know you're gonna probably also say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you said carbonic acid, you said before it was CO2. Well, let me tell you something, friends. Carbonic acid actually does, decomposes quite readily into water, water and carbon dioxide. So you're safe. Now you're gonna notice that there's an L right here. You can say, whoa, 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 we know aqueous means in dissolved in water. What is L? Liquid. Raise your hand if you think you know what the G stands for. What, what, what is it, sir? Gas. gas, absolutely, gas. And this is what we saw here are these bubbles. Now these bubbles that we saw are actually called, is CO2, like I said here. But you shouldn't really take my word for it. You should actually, let's do an experiment. What do you say? So one of the interesting facts about CO2 is that CO2 is used in many different fire extinguishers, namely for ones that are to put out flammable liquids as, as well as to put out electrical fires because it smothers it. The oxygen are attached too greatly, to have such an affinity for the, the carbon that they don't break apart. So let's see if we can see, let's see if we can 
make this so. So I'm going to make fire. They said, they told me when I got this gig, they said, you can't make anything on fire. And I was like, OK. <laughs> so now, if this is true, if this really, really, really is true, that there's CO2 in there, I ought to be able to scoop some out, right, with a cup. So let's go ahead. Please don't fall. This is the part where you're going to think I'm crazy. Er. All right. So if I have truly CO2 in here, it should put out that fire, right? Everybody say a prayer or whatever you like to say. So another interesting property about CO2 is that it's denser than air. Okay, so denser than air, this is, could be, you know, so this is why I have this tall sides on this aquarium, because if I had done this reaction on the table, it would have spilled out and I'd be kicking through it. You wouldn't see it because it's colorless and odorless, right? The only problem is you can't really see it, right? Because it is colorless. So let's go ahead and use some soap and see if we can actually get it to visualize itself. There ought to be a layer in here. I'm going to get my chair again. Don't fall, don't fall. So as you can see, there is something that those bubbles are floating on. It's floating on the layer of CO2, which is quite interesting to me. Now, if we watch this bubble, if it'll cooperate properly, if I have the, the right mixture in there, it'll actually expand and expand and expand as CO2 crosses its membrane. As it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it'll become more dense and, and sink. And when it finally sinks or just hits the sides and pop, like that, perfect timing, by the way, bubble, thank you very much. <laughs> That, uh, <laughs> that's right, give it up for the bubble, everybody. As you watch it, it uh, there is truly something going on there. This is truly something going on. So you're going to say, well, wait a minute, I see some white stuff in the bottom there. You can't really see it from where you're sitting, but trust me, it's there. There's white stuff in there. So that, my friends, is sodium acetate. Okay, sodium acetate is used in the industrial production of, or neutralization of sulfuric acid waste and textile. Uh, production, as well as um, used in uh, curing of concrete. It, it repels water quite well. And, but my favorite way of uh, experiencing sodium acetate is that delicious flavor that's on these particular chips. Mm. Mm. Quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. mm. So now you have another method for teaching this most wonderful chemical process between baking soda and vinegar. One that could serve as a model for the density of gases and how they relate to our atmosphere on our planet as well as atmospheres of other planets. Above all, I would like to close with this. Hold on, let me get this out of the way. Not that I'm going to do a cartwheel or anything, but I would like to close with this. It's very important for us to use appropriate models and analogy when teaching science to further develop the sense of scientific literacy that exists in our students. Because when we have scientifically literate students, this means that we have the beginnings of a scientifically literate society. And a scientifically literate society makes good decisions based on data. They care about their well-being of themselves as well as the environment. And they provide the fuel for the innovation that makes us great. On behalf of Florida Institute of Technology, I'm Jerry Campbell. Thank you very much. <laughs>